Welcome to EJB Talks, Rutgers Blaustein School Experts in Policy, Planning, and Health, where we talk with our faculty and staff experts, as well as students, about how the fields of public policy, urban planning, public health, health administration, and public and urban informatics affect your lives. Welcome to EJB Talks. I'm Stuart Shapiro, the Associate Dean of Faculty at the Blaustein School, and the purpose of this podcast is to talk with my colleagues and our alumni about policy, planning, and health, the interaction between these issues, and how they affect people in New Jersey, the United States, and the world. This podcast started in the wake of the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. One of our first guests was my colleague, Professor Don Muzan, who highlighted the inequalities that the pandemic laid bare. Today, we have her back on to see how this tragedy has progressed and what lies ahead. Welcome back, Don. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, Let me start off by asking one of the questions I asked last time, just in case people don't remember or didn't listen to that first podcast, which is wonderful. You should go back and listen to it. Um, uh, Why has COVID-19 had such a disparate impact? I was wondering if you could start off by re-explaining this for us. Sure. Um, I think the primary explanation I gave back then was that Black, Latino, and Indigenous people are more likely to have chronic conditions, many of which co-occur together and negatively affect the immune system. And these groups are also more likely to experience chronic stress due to poverty and racial discrimination. And those two things also weaken the immune system over time. Uh, So that kind of covers the main clinical risk factors for the illness. Um, And the other two risk factors, I believe I mentioned, were more social and institutional in nature and have to do with housing and labor market inequality. So the history of racial residential segregation continues to relegate Black and Latino people to crowded living conditions, often in urban communities. And with those denser housing structures and larger household sizes, it's much harder for people, obviously, to remain isolated either after they contract COVID-19 or when they become exposed to it. And in terms of the labor market, Black and Latino people are more likely to be frontline essential workers, typically in public-facing service positions, Um, that put them more at risk of acquiring COVID. So those are just some of the central reasons, I think, that help to explain the disparate impact on Black and brown communities. Yeah, no, that that, that sounds sadly familiar and and right. Um, Has anything changed over the past eight months to affect this for the better or worse? Or has it just been sort of confirmation of everything we saw um, at the onset of the pandemic? Yeah, I, I, I'd I, have to say no, unfortunately. I mean, at least I'm not pessimistic in this assessment by, think, you know, forecasting that things look worse. But I, I really have no op, you know reason to be optimistic that things will get better. I kind of think it will remain the same. Um, so I don't think these trends are unlikely to are likely to change anytime soon. Yeah, no, it's still it's it's the people that have to go back to work are the are first the the people that are more likely to be in those Black Latinx and Indigenous that communities true. that, that you mentioned. Um, and that sort of brings us to the non-health impacts, which I don't think we talked as much about last time, but I think we, we sort of know a lot more about right now. Um, can you talk a little bit about the disparities in the economic impacts of the pandemic and in the educational impacts? Oh, sure. Um, the impacts, as we all know, on individuals and families have just been nothing short of tragic, really. Uh, there have been unprecedented high rates of unemployment across the course of the pandemic. And unemployment um, is not randomly distributed. So the pandemic has really only exacerbated the disproportionate rates of unemployment among Black and, Black and Latino um, populations. Um, so, and in terms of educational disparities, we also know that they are not randomly distributed. Um, Black and Latino children have suffered even more since the pandemic began. So their schools were already under-resourced in terms of standard in-person teaching resources. So the abrupt move to remote learning has been far less seamless than in schools in uh, wealthier neighborhoods. And then of course you've got the technology gap. So low income students and students of color are less likely to own their own computer devices to support remote learning, especially quality and reliable devices. And they're less likely to have access to high quality and reliable Wi-Fi as well. And so all of those factors will, I think, exacerbate, well, we've seen they've exacerbated 
the educational disparities that existed before COVID. And and we mm-hmm. see not not just that people um, that remote is being done better in in wealthier whiter communities but remote is also less likely. I mean, the schools that go back, um, at least part-time or such, are more likely to be in those wealthier communities. That's right. That's right. Um, and they have this option of going to private schools if the public schools don't Right. And early on, um, you know, a lot of the wealthier children or families in the wealthier school districts, you know, sort of created these little pod systems to support um, remote learning. And those were, you know, opportunities that just weren't available to you know, students of color. I mean, the, the scary thing about this is it's something of an accelerant in inequality because it takes e- existing inequalities and sort of makes yeah. them worse for the yeah. long term because people that have are going to get the better education, they're going to get the spots in the better colleges, they'll get the better jobs eventually. No, you're, you're absolutely right. It really lights these things on fire. And, and not just in the temporary interim either. It's These are sort of impacts that are going to last for generations, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's turn to at least a little bit of optimism here uh, because this has been a downer so far. I, I have, have that effect you. on people. Uh, <laughs> in person, you, you, you're lovely. So. Uh, the, um, the vaccine has given us a, a small light at the end of the tunnel. Um, what do you expect in terms of different population, in terms of people that will have access to the vaccine and people that will be willing to get vaccinated? Yeah, sure. Um, in terms of uptake, uh, the good news is that overall trust in the vaccine has risen steadily since September 2020. Um, but there are some important gaps in vaccine intention across different socio-demographic um, groups. So there's a Pew Research study that was released in December 2020. And that found that men are more likely to report that they intend to get the vaccine, which was somewhat of a surprise, Um, as are adults who are older versus younger, those with more education, those who report being or leaning Democrat, and those with higher income. So those are the groups that are more likely to report that they intend to get the vaccine. But as many would have predicted, the biggest gap in terms of vaccine intention is found when you look at race ethnicity. Um, So this study found that Asians by far are the group that are most likely to report um, the intention to become vaccinated. So 83% of Asians said they would definitely or probably get the vaccine. And 63% of Latinos, 61% of whites plan to get the vaccine, but only 42% of Black Americans plan to get the vaccine. So they're the only group in which fewer than half of their population intends to become vaccinated. So that of course, you know, is an issue. And many point to the high levels of mistrust among Black Americans, and that's true. That mistrust does exist, but it's historically grounded, given medical abuses um, that have occurred, such as Tuskegee syphilis study and the theft of Henrietta Lacks cancer cells. So it's not just some random paranoia. I think it's important to make this point. Um, Black Americans have a reason to be skeptical and distrustful. It's not just some exotic cultural quirk that Black people have. So it's up to us really to make a concerted effort, I think, to acknowledge um, and validate and push through the barriers, these barriers, so that we can find a way to increase vaccine uptake among this group. So that's just uptake, but vaccine access, of course, is a different issue altogether. And I'm not sure we have really much preliminary data yet, given the slow vaccine rollout. Um, But if history were to repeat itself, which of course tends to do, uh, I would venture to guess that like many health resources, there will be lower access to the vaccine in low-income neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color. Right now, it's vaccine rollout is going at a snail's pace, pace everywhere. And whenever either a public health intervention or a medical technology is not universally offered or accessible, uptake will occur, as we were just discussing, among the most advantaged segments of the population first, which will, of course, further yeah. disparities that we already see. So what's the what's the message that has to go out to overcome that, as you said, justified skepticism mm-hmm. of the medical establishment that exists, particularly in Black communities? I don't know if it's as bad in Latin X or Indigenous communities, but what what's the message that has to go out to uh, to overcome? Well, that? and the high levels of mistrust um, certainly exist among other communities of color, but definitely um, the highest among Black communities. And um, I think you know it's it's many fold. I think. Uh, first, we have to really validate that their feelings are grounded. 
um, these things did happen um, and trust is earned like for anything, anybody, you know, trust is earned. Um, and when you have these sort of historical insults that happened in medical care, you know, decades ago, um, that's one thing, but then you still have the consistent, you know, unequal treatment that's given to black patients on a daily basis. So, um, so it's a lot to overcome. I think, again, first, maybe validating their concerns. I think it's important that we've seen a lot of um, black leaders, you know, saying they intend to get the vaccine, getting the vaccine. Um, it's important and really good that President Biden has put um, black physicians in, you know, positions of power um, and to sort of help um, bring down those walls of mistrust and model that sort of um, willingness to take the vaccine. So I think it, it, it will take time and it will take more resources sent to those communities to encourage them to um, become vaccinated. Gotcha. Now, and this is not an uptake issue, but I know there are some policies that also exacerbate some of these differences. One thing I read recently was that, you know, it's class 1A of vaccine eligibility or people who are 75 or older, but African-Americans tend to get the disease at younger ages. And so by putting that age restriction in there, you are not with any evil intent, I don't think, but you are, you know, de jure creating a, uh, a disparate impact mm-hmm. there. Um, what should we be doing differently policy-wise? I'm, I'm really so, so happy that you asked me this question because I think, it, you know, it took a long time, but slowly I think people are starting to recognize um, these important nuances. Um, so in, in public health, there's a well-known concept called weathering or early health deterioration among black and other marginalized populations. So because Black people are exposed to a lifetime of chronic stress due to poverty, discrimination, and so on, their physiological stress response or fight or flight response never turns off. And because of that, the constant activation of stress hormones wears down Black bodies prematurely. And in fact, a 2016 study uh, quantified the extent of weathering and found that African Americans developed three chronic conditions, um, hypertension, diabetes, and uh, cardiovascular disease on average 10 years earlier than white people. So all this to say that age-based policies and practices really do need to recognize these important differences. At age 75, black people tend to have the bodies of someone who is 85, or at least those who survived to the age of 75 in the first place. So I think that a more thoughtful and effective approach, especially when we're talking about vaccine distribution, would take an equity approach rather than an equality approach, which is what we currently have. So an equality approach proposes everyone should get the same thing. We should all get to have the same age standard for everyone because it's only fair that everyone receive the same thing. It's the logic. But an equity approach would instead focus on what each population needs, even if that comes in the form of like priority treatment for some groups. So the average life expectancy of black women is 76 years and average life expectancy of black men is 71.5 years, which means most of them won't even reach the age of 75 to qualify to receive the vaccine right now. And so I I know that many many Americans sort of inherently hold an equality perspective, but I also know that beginning in large part with the deaths of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, this past year has opened many, many of our eyes to the extent of racial inequity in this country. So with this new awareness, I really think we should all strive to adopt and advocate for an equity perspective that acknowledges and remedies you know, sort of these historical insults. So I think it's perfectly fine to have a different age standard and, and, and that would be fair and just. Toward that end, um, one, of the, uh, one of the other causes for optimism, at least as far as the uh, both vaccines and, and the course of the pandemic has been the change in presidential administrations that occurred earlier this week. Um, Toward that end of what you just talked about, what kind of policies are you looking for from the Biden administration where you'll say, wow, they get it. You know, this is this is a step in the right direction. Yes. Well, I didn't realize how long I had been holding my breath, but what a relief. (laughs) (laughs) Four years a long time. I think about four years. (laughs) Um, But yes, I, I really am hopeful for the first time in a really long time. And so some of the things I really appreciate that the Biden administration is doing is, and so again, not just discussing it in an abstract form, but really acting upon um, the need to address racial inequities in COVID-19. So 
his COVID-19 health Equ equity task force. And again, the term equity, not equality, um, which has been charged with um, ensuring an equitable pandemic response. However, they ultimately de determined to do that. And the fact that he's filling his cabinet with key governmental positions um, with scientists who he's, he's actually given the autonomy to lead the fight against COVID-19 really fills me with optimism. Um, of course, the direct payments for which he's advocating his executive order to um, extend the moratorium on evictions and foreclosures are really important incremental efforts, I think, to address um, these racial and ethnic inequities. Um, and I'm, I'm optimistic that he's taking a much different leadership approach um, to the pandemic in so many ways, but as in maybe one of the most important ways is the way he intends for the federal government to take a far more central role in coordinating the COVID-19 response. Uh, so, you know, I'm really looking forward to that leadership at the federal level to help ramp up vaccine administration and production. Yeah, let's, let's get yeah. them out there. Um, is there anything else on this subject you want to add um, for our audience? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, it was a picture you gave us, and you can tell me if I'm wrong about this, that uh, a lot to be pessimistic about, but at least for the first time in a while, some things to be optimistic Absolutely. about moving Absolutely. forward. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming thank on you again. Thank for having me. It was a lot of fun. Um, also, a big thank you to our production team, Amy Cobb and Karen Olson. We'll be back next week with another talk from another expert from the Blaustein School. Thanks for listening and stay safe.